NAT Routers Part 3 Port Forwarding How to configure your NAT router to allow remote clients to access a server that you are hosting on your LAN. If you've seen the AskMrWizard.com movies entitled Simple Routers for Small Networks Part 1 Client Firewalls and Simple NAT Routers Part 2 Multiple PCs, then you know how a low-cost NAT router protects the computers on your LAN from evil people and evil processes on the worldwide Internet. If you haven't seen those movies yet, then you really ought to view them before proceeding here, because this movie builds on those concepts. The essential message of those two movies is just this. A NAT router doesn't know what to do with incoming communication unless it first learns about processes in your computers that are expecting messages. It simply discards any incoming message that it isn't expecting. There are two basic methods through which your NAT router can learn how to handle processes on your network that are expecting messages. In those other two movies, we talked about the way client programs are handled. In this movie, we will talk about the ways by which your NAT router learns about server processes. First, let's clarify the differences between clients and servers. When we say server, you can think of a great big listening ear, because server processes spend their idle time constantly listening for incoming requests. They are always ready to answer questions addressed to them if they are written in a language and format that they understand. Like other processes in your computers, they are always assigned a process ID number by your operating system. By long-standing convention, communicating processes are assigned numbers known as ports through which client processes can reach them with their inquiries or requests. It is commonplace to say that a server process is listening on some TCP or UDP port. Even when running simultaneously on different computers in different internet locations, the best-known, longest-established server processes are almost always assigned the same port numbers inside each host, which eventually become well-known, contrib contributing to the informal, evolving standardization of internet communication. Thus, it is easy for clients to find well-established servers. When we say client, you can think of a great big question mark because client processes are activated on the network when somebody needs information or needs a question answered. Unlike server processes, which are generally left running all the time, client processes are generally shut down when they're not needed. Operating systems generally assign unpredictable, random-looking process ID and port numbers to client processes, and they change from instance to instance. When a client process sends an inquiry to a server process on a well-known port number, the inquiry message always includes the port number on which that client expects to receive an answer. Server processes use this port number information in combination with the client's IP address to ensure that their response information is delivered to the right place. The mechanisms that your router uses for intercepting translating and relaying server messages are generally not as automated as the mechanism for handling client messages. You will probably need to use your favorite web browser, as described in our movie entitled Managing Your Network Equipment with Your Web Browser, to send port forwarding configuration commands to your router for every server process that you want to host on any of your local computers. If you have a server process, such as a web server, an internet game server, peer-to-peer -peer file sharing, instant messaging, or the well-known TeamSpeak 2 internet voice server that, that you want to host on one of your local computers for access by clients over the internet, it will come with documentation revealing one or more TCP or UDP ports on which it will listen for incoming requests. Some server processes need just one TCP port. Some need just one UDP port. Some need one or more of each. Some are dynamic, and they may need access to thousands of ports within some prescribed range. Some are agile, able to adapt with varying efficiency to varying port availability situations. Consult your server program's documentation as you install it on one of your local computers and write down a list of all of the TCP and UDP ports that your server needs. You will teach your NAT router about those ports. 
After the server software is running, fire up your favorite browser, connecting with the local IP address of your NAT router. If your network is typical, this will be the same IP address that all of your PCs specify as their default gateway. Often it is 192.168.0.1 or maybe 192.168.1.1. When your router asks for your identity and password, log in using whatever, whatever information you have previously configured for router management. After that, explore your router's menu choices, looking for any of the following four terms. Port triggering, port forwarding, DMZ, demilitarized zone, or universal plug and play, UPNP. All of these ter terms have become well known during the past few years and all will help you to inform your router of server processes running on your local computers. We will examine the most complex of these terms first and we'll work our way back to the basics. In each case, the information you provide will inform your router of the IP address and port numbers on which a local server process listens for incoming requests. Even though you can have as many as 253 different computers in your local network, and even though every one of those computers can, can have server processes running on any one of 65,536 TCP ports and 65,536 UDP ports, your router can only be told about one of your computers hosting a process that is listening on any given port. As a consequence of this NAT limitation, even though you can host multiple servers of the same type, Internet users will only be able to use the well-known port value to communicate with one of them. So, if you have three computers hosting three separate copies of the TeamSpeak server on the usual and customary ports, then TeamSpeak clients can use all three of them on your local LAN, but you can only tell your router about one of them, and only that one will be accessible to outsiders. If you want outsiders to use any of the remaining TeamSpeak servers, you'll have to configure them to use non-standard ports, and you'll have to forward those ports in your router, and you'll have to inform your users of this non-standard behavior, and they will have to configure their TeamSpeak clients accordingly. Of the four terms listed above, port forwarding, port triggering, DMZ, and universal plug and play, the first is the most basic and the last is the most advanced. In fact, universal plug and play is so advanced that you probably want to disable it. Unless you disable universal plug and play, it tries to completely automate the configuration of your router for server processes on your LAN. Although this may be convenient, it opens up important security weaknesses. Evil stinkware might use any of your computers to host really nasty servers at your expense if you leave universal plug and play active. You may soon find that your computers are sending instant messages without your knowledge or hosting spam servers or broadcasting adware, distributing spyware and, and clogging your internet connection with advertising messages or worse. Today's implementations of universal plug and play generally do not even allow you to examine the holes that they open up for your security. Somebody, somebody else could own your computer services and you might not even know. Don't go there unless you are very vigorous about monitoring the help, health of your computers and their network usage. The DMZ or demilitarized zone features also invite security problems. In this context, DMZ allows you to designate one of your computers as the host for all services that are not otherwise defined. This allows you to host almost any kind of server on that machine, even if you don't know what ports the machine communicates on, but it also sets that machine up as the target for every hacker and every stinkware application infesting the internet. Think, come and get me! And once that machine is compromised, the stinkware may be able to flow to your other computers from inside your LAN, as if the hackers could drop paratroopers behind your lines of defense, bypassing the protection ordinarily offered by your NAT router. Our advice regarding DMZ is the same as our advice regarding universal plug and play. Don't go there unless you are very vigorous about monitoring the health of your computers and their network usage, or unless you install an additional NAT router in series to create an inner, more isolated LAN 
for your other computers. As illustrated here, a second NAT router, in series with the first, creates a new IP subnet with a distinct set of IP addresses in between the ISP network and your previous private network. Servers hosted here are fully accessible to the worldwide internet, and clients on the innerLAN can access them too. But if a server on this new DMZ subnet is ever attacked and corrupted, it cannot easily compromise the computers on the inner network. Port forwarding is the best known of these tools, and everybody uses the term port forwarding to describe generally these principles. In its most basic and popular form, port forwarding amounts to manually filling in one or two tables on your router. The best routers use large, separate tables for TCP and UDP processes, while cheaper routers combine both into a single, small table. Each table entry will precisely describe an individual hole through your NAT router firewall, which should lead to a server process. Thereafter, processes in your NAT router will recognize, intercept, translate, and relay incoming messages addressed to those TCP or UDP ports. Each entry will begin with a reference to a port number, either individually or as part of a group. The entry will then continue with the IP address of the computer on your local network to which all incoming traffic addressing that port should be sent. As an example, suppose you wish to host a web server on a PC whose local IP address is 192.168.0.2. Because web servers generally listen on TCP port 80, the corresponding router table entry would look something like this. TCP 80 colon 192.168.0.2 Implications of this setup are simple. Everybody in the world will be able to use any browser to examine all the information your web server publishes. They will set their browsers to send client inquiries to TCP port 80 of your NAT router. Your router will relay those inquiries to the web server on TCP port 80 of the PC on your LAN that has IP address 192.168.0.2. Now, if any of those users knows of a weakness in the web server you are using, he or she can look for a browser version or an imitation browser or an exploit that can be configured to exploit that weakness. If your web server is well configured and well supported, and if you keep up to date with patches for it, then they won't be able to access anything that you don't intend to publish. If the computer at 192.168.0.2 is switched off, or when its web server is not listening on port 80, the port 80 hole through your firewall doesn't lead to anything that can be exploited. Almost all routers support port forwarding. Proceed with caution. Port triggering is like port forwarding, but it's a little smarter and more dynamic. If you manage it properly, it's a little bit more secure. Instead of leaving the designated ports open all the time, Port triggering leaves them closed until it sees some kind of related, designated activity on your LAN, indicating that the associated server has actually been started up. The port is then forwarded for a period of time. The port remains open for as long as traffic continues to flow. If traffic stops flowing for a period of time, the port is automatically closed, but remains ready for automatic reopening when related local traffic is seen again. The time value can be configured with your port forwarding tools. Some routers support port triggering and others do not. The documentation accompanying some server programs includes information to help you configure port triggering. If you can find the required information, and if your router supports port triggering, we recommend that you take advantage of it. Otherwise, just use port forwarding. Conclusions NAT routers allow you to host server processes, but your router must be informed of the ports on which those processes listen for incoming requests. Only one server process can receive incoming requests addressed to each port on the router. At least four separate mechanisms have become popular for configuring your NAT router in support of your server processes. We sometimes refer to all four of these techniques with a general term, port forwarding. Two of these four mechanisms are so insecure as to invite attack, and their use demands constant vigilance. 
The other two mechanisms are a little more difficult to configure, but they provide a level of security that is consistent with generally accepted responsible internet behavior, so long as the corresponding server processes are well managed.